And thank you to all of you for being there. It's a pleasure for me to uh, have the opportunity to give one lecture in your master for the second year. Um, as David just introduced, I am a, so a social economist, which means that I'm working on uh, economical practices and processes from a social science perspective. And uh, it's important to say, too, that English is not my strongest language. I'm used to work in Portuguese and Spanish. So please do not hesitate to interrupt me should anything not be clear. It's important that um, we make sure that <laughs> we can communicate properly. So I'm, I'm going to uh, take you to Brazil to have a look at one aspect of uh, the broader field of eco ecological engagement. By this, I mean different kinds of mobilization for different issues uh, in the ecological field. And in particular, I would like to uh, discuss with you of a, special, uh, of a specific <coughs> subject, which is a commitment of women farmers uh, to agroecology in Brazil. I will define the terms, but let me say that uh, I'm talking of agroecology in the Brazilian sense, which is quite broad, agroecology, uh, which is not only a technical uh, model in agriculture, but also, I would say, a model of political economy and also a social movement, as we will see uh, in, in a short moment. Uh, let me tell you too that um, what I'm, I'm speaking of women farmers here too in reference to uh, Brazilian political categories where the uh, category of uh, agricultura familiar, of family agriculture has been defined, has been recognized uh, since the 1990s and uh, these women have def different identities, some of them will recognize as peasants other as indigenous women, other as uh, so-called quilombola uh, in Brazil, which are descendant from black slaves. And I'm using the generic category of women farmers uh, as uh, a general term. So as an introduction, um, let's, oops, let's have a look uh, at um, some pictures of that kind of commitment to agroecology I am speaking of. And um, here on the first um, on the first picture, you can see. Okay. Yes. So we have um, three pictures with three different aspects of such commitment. On the first one, um, with uh, one of these women farmer uh, making a, a, a kind of soil fertilization. We have agroecology in practice, and uh, the kind of everyday commitment to. Uh, uh, an ecological way of doing agriculture. But we have also other scales and other dimension of that kind of commitment. Here on the second picture, on uh, on the left side, of the on the bottom, you can see one of those uh, local organizations uh, which, which are dependently, depend on the context, some uh, association, networks, unions, cooperatives, informal groups, but the collective dimension at the territory level is very important in any context. And then here on the third picture, you have the uh, very visible, broad uh, political mobilization and what I can say is also kind of engagement in the public space. Uh, in this case, um, a march called Marcha das Margaridas, which is a very big event uh, joining different uh, women from uh, different territories in Brazil in defense of uh, buen vivir, of living well and democracy and uh, adopting the agenda of agroecology since several years. So what I mean with this introduction is just that we have very different levels and we have to work across the levels to understand how uh, agroecology becomes a political issue to these women and why are these women important to that kind of political issue. Um, agroecology, uh, as I said, is uh, on one hand a practice and knowledge as uh, theorized by different author. Here I will put a few of them. If some of you have interest, I can give the references later. Uh, 
uh, broadly speaking, these are practice and knowledge which are a kind of uh, ecologi ecologization of agriculture, a way to insert the uh, production of particular food items into ecological flows of energy, of uh, materiality um, at different, uh, in different uh, uh, forms. Um, agroecology is food oriented towards food security and food quality and I will say also to uh, culinary culture and it is a way to uh, conceive of, agri of agricultural knowledge which brings into dialogue peasant and scientific knowledge seeking some form of horizontality or at least uh, retroaction between scientists and peasants. But um, especially in Brazil, agroecology is more than just practice and technique, it is also a political economy and a social movement in the sense that the difference of that kind of agricultural model has become very political. Um, it has become, um, I would say, a political banner. Can we say that in English? Banner, uh, like um, a common uh, uh, slogan or a common um, identity, ac actually, uh, for people, a common cause, as I post on, <laughs> on my slide, for people who are opposed to uh, dif different dimension of the dominant agricultural model, which is access to land, which is a kind of inputs in agriculture that you use, which is the kind of social relations, of economic relation, which, has, which are embedded in the agricultural model and uh, which are also the kind of ecological impacts that you have from different agricultural models. So it is much more than just practice and technique, it's also a, a completely different way to organize the economy from the territories, and we will come back to that point too. And <laughs> empirically, uh, when you look at the people who are at the basis of that uh, agroecological movement in Brazil, you will, you will find many, many women, you will find many, many local communities, and particularly traditional communities, indigenous community or quilombola communities, for example, but there are also other kind of traditional communities in Brazil. And of course, there is a, <laughs> a structural reason to that, and that's why I call the fact that these people are all at the basis of the reproduction of life. From their social position, from the economic system as a well, whole, these are the people who are most exposed in their body, in their everyday experience to uh, the kind of negative uh, ecological impact of the dominant model. And that's why exactly those people will be the political subject of agroecology uh, in general. We will come back to that, but I'm just giving the broad picture. So, um, yes. So what I would like to, to speak with you today is uh, what uh, ecology or agroecology in particular is doing to political engagement. What does that mean that this kind of subaltern subject are going to commit to agroecology? What that means from the broader ecological debate that this kind of very subaltern people in the periphery of Brazil are organizing, uh, mobilizing at broader levels, but that do, what is that doing to issue of justice, to issue of, of reproduction of life, and also to the forms of organization which are um, at the basis of the ecological agenda. What, what, what does that mean when you have not uh, urban um, middle class or upper class citizens who mobilize, but you have peasant women's uh, in a very uh, distant rural territories and connected to networks with other uh, uh, similar subjects. But what does that do to engagement? Uh, and also I will uh, take a, a very transversal, a very uh, uh, cross-cutting look, look excuse me, at the issue of gender. We are not just speaking of women, but we are speaking of gender relations and particularly uh, the, the issue of why these men or women participate or not at different levels of the construction of such engagement. Okay. Um, and to do so, 
I will base on a project which is called uh, Gengibre. Gengibre is ginger in Portuguese, and it's a medicinal plant. It's also a plant which has some very deep roots and which make rhizomes and which um, like um, expand through territory, which can build networks, so it's a symbol, but it's also an acronym, it's because it's on gender in Brazil. So, But the full name of the project is Relationship with Nature and Gender Equality, Feminist Mobilization and Practice in Agroecology in Brazil. It is a collective project with about uh, 18 people participating. Um, you can see, uh, if you're interested, the, the full team presentation on our website. Uh, I'm the coordinator of, of this project, which is funded by the French INR. It is an interdisciplinary project. Here I'm from social sciences, you, so you, you, will, you will notice that I am not uh, an agroecology specialist, I can just speak very broadly, but we have some colleagues which are specialists. <laughs> um, and we uh, work with uh, um, a feminist and inter intersectional analysis throughout uh, the projects. It's a collaboration between France and Brazil, and rather than naming every organization, I want to stress that we are working uh, with a transdisciplinary approach, meaning that we are not just in the academy, but trying to do a co-construction of knowledge with exactly that kind of uh, groups, association, cooperatives of local women farmers in the territories. We have six of them and we have two NGOs um, working with us too. And these are NGOs which are not just executing projects but who are actually uh, organizing the social movements. So we try to make that kind of uh, action research and co-construction of knowledge. Um, and to finish with this introduction, I will um, I will explicit uh, I will explain um, uh, at quite general level how our data are constructed. Uh, in so far as I will uh, present uh, or I will actually mobilize some data to to make my arguments later. So we are we are working uh, from the micro level, from the family level, with thirty peasant women's. Um, with them, we have a very, um, I would say, deep uh, relations. We are spending, s we have spent several days in the house of each of, of these women, and we are doing what we call a feminist ethno mapping of their uh, of their property or the, the place where they live. Some of them have collective uh, uh, lands and not just family lands, but uh, that's a kind of uh, a look at the way people are practicing agroecology and how this is embedded into social relation and particularly gender relation at the family level. We're also speaking to the husbands or sons or fathers. We are also speaking to men. We are making interviews separated with men and women in order to, uh, to get the, the gender relation at that level. <coughs> We are also uh, and simultan simultaneously working with six uh, of these groups of women farmers uh, in two regions of Brazil. I'm sorry, I forgot to tell that. Just get back one second to, to, the, to the slide before. We are working in Minas Gerais and in Vale do Ribeira, uh, which are two regions two region in the southeast of Brazil. And it, in each of these regions, we, have, we are working with three uh, groups of women farmers, which means six in total. And at this collective level, we are doing some kind of social cartography, we are mapping um, straits, environmental straits and resistances, we are also uh, reconstructing the history of the territories from the point of view of these women in order to, to show uh, processes that are normally uh, invisible or very uh, difficult to see. And finally, we are also working with some more classical, conventional um, uh, data collection tools like interviews, uh, documentary collection, observation, etc. And of course, not only in, in the agroecological movement, but also, for instance, with uh, agribusiness companies and political um, uh, uh, leaders, etc., etc. Okay. Um, so that being said, I would 
like to make like a, a movement of looking at that kind of commitment from f four uh, complementary uh, point of view. First of all, I would like to ask committee to what exactly, and then committed from what social position. Thirdly, uh, how does that happen? Eh? What the process of constructive com commitments, and finally committed against what, okay? So in doing so, we are uh, beginning with a very local level and then we will we will gain some, some more broader perspective on the, on the issue. So committed to what exactly? Um, let's have a look. Which agriculture are we talking about? So we are t <laughs> these women are committed to very uh, simple, everyday issues which are affecting their lives uh, and not, firstly, uh, on, on very broader cause. So, for example, uh, here on the first picture, um, it's, it's a, a, a picture which circulated on one of the WhatsApp groups of, um, uh, of the women farmers and uh, the, the, the woman sent it to the others saying, look what I have in my, in my kitchen, and that's all products of, uh, of her own production in, in, in the vegetable garden, but also in, the, in, the, uh, in her kitchen, and every, everybody would uh, applaud at this and find it very, very impressive. That's typically the, the kind of, of, of content that uh, would circulate on those groups. Um, but then, taking a more controversial view uh, on the second picture, you can see um, a vegetable garden of one of the women, and here you see a fence, and behind the fence uh, you can have a look at the uh, monoculture of coffee which is grown by her husband, and um, you can see that on the same plot of land, uh, with a distance of 20 centimeters, maybe you have uh, the coexistence, which is uh, absolutely not pacific, a very tense coexistence between one model and the other. Uh, in, her m in the coffee monoculture, the husband will use glyph glyphosate uh, and other kind of agrotoxins, and uh, this is a permanent dispute within the couple about uh, the contamination of the air, of water, and of the soil, and this is very, very near, as you can see. And then on the uh, third picture, uh, you can have a look at different issue, which is mining. Uh, mining is a very, very strong uh, issue in, in Brazil, in Latin America as a well. whole. And here, for instance, um, you can see a small sign which has been put up by a group of women if one in one of the community, which says, for our waters, agroecology, and future generations, no mining here. Um, and then we, we will come back to that at the end, mobilized again, WAST, and what does that mean that mining is coming into that territory, and why are there women uh, who are uh, putting that kind of sign in the communities? Um, and here I, um, I have a, a long quote, but I hope it's worth reading it about a different issue, which is um, carbon compensation and more broadly uh, the kind of environmental compensation which is being made in different areas of uh, rainforest in, in, in South countries. So here um, it's a citation from um, kind of focus group on, on the green economy in one of the of the association we are working with. Uh, and it's saying the following. The first uh, woman to speak is actually a local leader. She is a Kilombola woman and she says, a company that was committing itself here, you know, to recovering degraded areas and improving the air. That's the way she perceives uh, the carbon compensation. Eh? Uh, they came up with some crazy ideas. Everyone would take an area and plant some plants that they would treat with some other inputs, like wire and hydrogel, and leave the area. Then everyone in the community said they weren't going to plant any plants from outside. We were going to be paid to open it and fence it of 15 reais a day. Then everyone said there was no problem in recovering these degraded areas, except that afterwards, you would not be able to harvest anything to plant any other variety. At certain meetings, they said we could. Then suddenly, another technician turned up 
We had five technicians in one year, and another woman. They appeared and disappeared. They were a pain in the arse until 2013. Then we understood better. We understood better, and they 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 they, uh, they rejected uh, the project. So, what is meant here is that. It's, there is a difficulty for these communities to understand what is being proposed to them, what kind of uh, conception of nature is being embedded in that kind of compensation project, is it compatible or not with their own community, and who is going to be able to decide on what to plant and how and uh, whether the land is going to be um, fenced up or not. Yeah, that's uh, the issue of privatizing land or keeping the land as a common. Okay, so that's another kind of conflict which is very, very pervasive in, in, in several territories we are working with. So what we see here is a kind of everyday environmentalism, uh, reproducing life, uh, like theorized, for example, from Nathalie Blanc and uh, Padeux. Um, which means that we are on very local scale, we are, oh, not we, but these women are defending not life in general, they are not angels of the agroecosystem, like another feminist said, they are no angels of ecology, they are just defending the lives that matter to them from very local scale, which is absolu absolutely logical, yes. Um, and they have their own vision of nature, of course, and that's not exactly the same vision from one region to, to another, from a Quilombola community to um, peasants uh, communities, but they have their own vision. And this vision, of course, is not compatible with mining, is not compatible to agribusiness, and in a far uh, extent is not compatible neither to compensation, uh, to the kind of environmental compensation which is being proposed to them. So there are conflicts, and there are the kind of uh, social environmental conflict which has been uh, theories in Latin American literature, uh, for example, by, uh, by Axel Hard or by Maristela Svampa, and which are basically uh, conflicts about the vision of nature and territories. What, what is legitimate or not? What can we do with nature? What, what kind of environment do we want? And what, how do we decide on what is good for, for our territory or not? Um, and this, um, these conflicts are particularly strong around the agriculture and mining model and uh, around the so-called green economy, which has been accused to be a commodification of nature and which indeed is in, in many cases. Um, and there, is, uh, uh, there are several forms of structural violence in, in them. Um, we, which come from very long colonial history in Latin America and which has been renewed um, in different cycles, I believe, uh, until today. Um, so that's the structural reasons why these women uh, are engaged to some kind of agroecological commitment, but there are, of course, limits to the engagement, which are the limit of scales, the limit of power and equality, etc. Um, and here, um, the kind of, of uh, social um, cartographies we are producing, it's a little small, I don't remember if I have a zoom, yes, I have a zoom. So here, for instance, that's, um, let's start maybe with the biggest one. Um, here we have a, a, a map uh, for one of the district of one of the municipality we are working with, so you see there are very local data. And uh, the points on the map are communities, and for each community, uh, we had discussion about uh, what are the threats in the perception of women, and how do they build their resistances. And so this has been very long discussions, and what we tried to do as a research team was to make some kind of more uh, general um, conceptualist discussion with them, trying to to define categories. Um, for instance, here on the on the zoom of one community, uh, here you have on the first line the kind of resistance they are um, um, they are doing, um, and every every um, picture here. Uh, um, um, correspond to one analytical category. Uh, I have to have 
well, I should have brought the legend in, in biggest, but I will just explain to you. Uh, here you have uh, a category which is on the defense of social cultural identities, which in that case take the form of different fest and different kind of um, it's difficult to explain in English. <laughs> uh, different kind of rituals which involve plants, which involve spirituality, uh, and which in some way express a vision of nature. They are a praxis of that vision of nature. Okay, and this is the kind of thing that that are commitments, ecological commitment at the level of that woman, and many many analyses were just ignore, don't see, don't perceive that kind of resistance. So we try to get very close to that woman in order to perceive that kind of resistances. And then here you have another category, which is about local organization. Here's its network, which, call, which is called regime, uh, which, which is important to that woman. And here you have some kind of more um, social political organization in a local union, some kind of uh, fight for their access to land. And here you have um, as the more social economic organization uh, with a cooperative and a local groups of women. And here on the second line, you have the kind of um, impacts of threats that they perceive. They perceive the contamination uh, through agrotoxins in that case. Uh, they perceive the kind of um, ecological um, um, uh, unbalance uh, through the fact that water is being uh, drawn out of the territory for a different culture and also for mining. Uh, here against mining, and they also, um, we also uh, collectively uh, make some relation with the kind of violence that they are uh, encountering uh, as women, and uh, we, we have a, a more detailed analysis of that. So, you see, that they are very everyday, they are everyday <laughs> commitments to, to everyday matters. So, that's um, the first point, uh, mobilized against what and then to, to move further and to, to take the second step of our uh, movement uh, mobilized from what social position why do we have so many women there and what does that mean to feminist theory um, that this kind of, uh, of women farmers women are mobilized to reproducing life in their territories which debates in feminism does that arise um, here too, I, um, I think it's worth taking a look at, at what they said. And these women who are farmers, who are mothers, who are healers, who have midwives, which are all positions in the middle of the of different aspects of the reproduction of lives. Um, and the first, uh, the first verbatim is um, the kind of uh, is an extract actually from a little booklet which is called a biocultural protocol, which is a kind of a memory of the the culture of one community, and it says the following: the community inhabitants fondly remember Dona Veronica, a midwife and healer, who was known for her for her spiritually and faith, and for being a reference in, in the community's health care through teas, prayers, blessings, and rituals. So it's interesting to, to see the place that this particular woman plays into uh, the conception, the own conception of one community and the kind of practice which is being highlighted, which is spiritually using plants and um, uh, and caring of the people, of the other people, with uh, the kind of knowledge that she has from plants. And the second, the second one is a citation of one woman farmer, which says, and it's, it's very <laughs> striking, it's a good feeling of exchanging seeds. I think it means confronting mining. The more we exchange, diversifying territory, the more we create resistance. So it's striking to me for several reasons, um, and one of them is the scale. Uh, you you <laughs> just imagine, um, for her, exchanging seeds, such a small thing, is like resisting to a global fort, which is mining a, a, a national company, in that case, coming to their territories. So it speaks of resistance, and it speaks, of course, of also of unbalance of power. 
And the third one, um, selling our products to get our money and help out around the house, giving satisfaction for what we've spent and that makes us happy. Which goes through our, our whole body and another joy is eating our products which are healthy and fresh, a woman farmer. That's a kind of, of, uh, of citation which makes uh, many feminists very nervous <laughs> because it seems very essentialist. But on the other side, we have to take that seriously. What does that mean? Um, how, how do we work with that dimension of body, of emotion, of feeling happy or connecting to the, the kind of products that, that I'm being eaten with? just not can discard it as being a kind of essentialist view on women. You have to, you have to, to, to take that seriously and, and to uh, analyze what's, what that means. And then the, the last one, uh, with my first child, I had a postpartum depression. At the time, I was on the board of the STR, which is a Sindicato dos Trabalhadores Rurais, uh, a local uh, rural workers union. I couldn't let go of work. I felt that if I left, everything would stop happening. I felt judged in many ways for giving up the STR and also for not prioritizing the pregnancy as a child, a woman farmer. So she's speaking guns very clearly about some conciliation uh, problem and uh, a problem of division, of sexual division of labor of work overload of women and the difficulty of being at the same time a mother and agriculture and uh, a political leader in her community, which is also uh, a huge problem in the in the, the feminist debate. So, um, what what is uh, uh, um, the common logic now in in this different uh, situation is the logics of caring. Yeah? The women are committing to agroecology from the social position of being some carers, some people who take care of others and also of the environment. And for this woman, this is like a continuum. There is no separation between the social and the environmental, between caring for people and caring for the environment. And their everyday practices, this come all together. No? Um, for instance, they are mothering, they are cooking, they are recycling food waste, and in doing so, they are fertilizing the soil, they are breeding animals, they are growing plants and trees, they are collecting medicinal plants. So you see, there's no, uh, uh, there's no way uh, to, to analytically separate which what would be social caring and environmental caring. This come all together and this is a cross-cutting logic of their, of their practice. Um, and um, on the picture, uh, well, we see, you see some picture of Quilombola women cooking across the, across the generation in that case and the kind of vegetable garden of animal breedings and on the first picture, um, you have uh, one of the collective of women, that's a picture which I found very, very <laughs> nice. And they are here and uh, they, they are working together. They are, they are practicing what in Brazil is known as mochirão, uh, which is a way to, uh, to work one day in, in, the, in the plot of one woman and another day in the plot of another woman and to be able to uh, to make a big work uh, because you have, for example, here about 10 women working on the same day. So um, that logic of caring is not just one woman in her own kitchen, but it's also a collective and a transgeneration um, activity and, and I would say knowledge exchange. So why, why is it complicated in particular for, <laughs> for feminist theory? I, I, I will not go very deeply into feminist theory, but we have at the same time an ethic. Yeah? You are wanted to care, it's, it's right, it's good, it's necessary, it's just, um, I mean, we all need care. It's a word without care is not possible. 
uh, but at the same time, caring is work. It's an undervalued work. It's an invisible work, and not remunerated work. And that's why, for example, uh, that woman at the STR was feeling judged for not caring, and she she was overloaded. So it's very very intrinsic uh, problem. And caring is a relationship. Caring is. Um, you cannot escape from caring because uh, this will break all your relationships. You cannot just say, well, I will stop caring for my mother, I will stop caring for my mother-in-law, I will stop caring for my child, because that's human relations. So that's, at the same time, absolutely meaningful and obligatory. That's uh, very, very um, ambivalent and multidimensional um, uh, dim dimension. Um, feminist and, for, for instance, the well-known work of uh, Silvia Fedelici uh, have um, analyzed uh, on social reproduction and se sexual division of labor in order to show that sexual division of labor is not only a complementarity between men and women, but that's actually the very basis of male domination, that's the very basis of gender inequality, that's a kind of hierarchization of male and female um, work. And so saying that that women are committed to agroecology from the current position is complicated. It's complicated because that can mean reinforcing uh, the exact rules that maintain them at the bottom of the social hierarchy and which reproduce male domination, okay? Um, <coughs> so, on, on, on that point, we are, uh, we are um, um, speaking around the, the issue of essentialis essentialism. Uh, are, are, are we, at the moment, taking some kind of essentialist view on women? Are we saying that because they are women, because they are born women, uh, biologically, they have to be the one who care, they have to be the one who take care of the ecosystem, they have to be the one who engage, who commit to agroecology. Or what, what are we actually uh, analyzing at the moment? So I, I think it's some, in some, to some extent, it's a kind of false debate. Actually, uh, of course, some of the citations that I have shown you uh, might be might be read as being very essentialist, but actually. For me, it's a false debate because that's the only position they can start off. <laughs> they have no other position. So maybe we dislike it, maybe we wish it would be another way, but actually they are in that social position of caring. Uh, we observe that they are mobilizing, they are committed to uh, the environment from that social position. So actually, for me, the, 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 the question the other. The question is about resignifying, res about um, can we say that in English? We signifying? Yes, okay. Uh, we redefining. redefining, giving another meaning uh, to the social positions they are in. That means giving some more value, that means uh, getting some social recognition, that means getting some monetary value, maybe in some cases, to what they are doing, but not thinking that they should start from another position because they have no others, okay? Um, there is an interesting literature uh, by Spivak, by the Indian subaltern theory Spivak, about strategic essentialism, which has been much discussed, but I think it's worth <laughs> considering. And we said, well, people are not um, are not um, fools. They are they are aware that they are in in a subaltern position, but. Some, in some, to some extent, they are just being strategic at that time. They are getting from that position, and then they are doing what's uh, it's in, in their interest at the moment, and maybe later the position will change. So that's more or less what I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, yes. And I know, is that clear enough? Yes? Okay. Um, I'm moving to my third point and having a lot at times, that's okay. So um, now we are going to take a more processual view at how that all happened. Eh? Because for now I, I have shown you things that already happened, but we haven't looked uh, yet at what the process of, of constructing that kind of commitment, and particularly uh, at the collective level. 
So um, there are several dimensions. Um, I'm not pretending to any kind of exhaustivity, but I was just point some dimensions that uh, seems important to me, to us in the Gengible project. And the first one is a kind of feminist popular education, uh, which is working as politization, politicization. And all um, the kind of uh, local groups, association, cooperatives, networks I have been speaking about, uh, you have that kind of situation of the women farmers themselves or the NGOs we are, which are working with them and the social movements making some kind of very grassroots uh, formation, discussing issues uh, which are not <laughs> only theoretical, which, which has which are always very grounded into praxis. Here, for example, uh, that woman, she is a woman farmer and she is explaining to the other the way the truck should pick up their products in order to be able to sell them to some consumers group in Sao Paulo and that's a kind of redefining value of giving, in that case, some monetary value to their production which involve collective action and organization. Um, in that kind of, I, I call it popular education in, in reference to the, um, I, sh I think I missed, I forgot to, to put the reference on the slide, but I'm speaking in relation to Paulo Freire's work in, in Brazil, in Latin America, and also the author of Orlando, uh, Orlando Fares Borda, for, for instance, in, in Colombia, which means that um, the, the, the educational process is taking place into a local context and um, embedded into the kind of issues uh, that come from the people. And it's, it is not a formation process to come from, from, from above, but which is uh, being built up from below. And in that kind of processes, uh, what happens is that um, private issues are becoming public. Ah, okay, so I'm not the only one uh, who have a problem in getting some value of my production. I'm not the only one with, who is confronting the husband putting the uh, kind of monoculture of cafe 20 centimeter to my vegetable garden. I'm not the only one confronting a mining company trying to uh, to get a concession of my plot, etc., etc. Um, in that kind of spaces, um, the invisible work of reproduction of lies is seen as a valuable work. On the second picture here, uh, the women are building, um, how you call it, maquette in English? Um, a small model, they are building a small model of, of what would be um, uh, 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 an ideal marketplace for them where they would be uh, comfortable to sell their products and they are uh, planning some very collective organization with a place for children for example and they are saying that there would be two women taking care of children on the marketplace at, and that this woman will be paid for the, uh, from the others in order to make that work because it is a valuable work and it should not be uh, invisible. Um, in uh, that kind of spaces too, um, the women are disputing agroecology. Agroecology is a common term and like any kind of this very broad common term, there are several trends in them and um, there is a more technician, a more mainstream uh, current in, in agroecology and these women will uh, collectively affirm that what they are doing at a small scale with a very diversified production, with a transformation of food in their kitchen is a whole and very uh, important part of, of agroecology. Uh, the dimension of biodiversity, the dimension of seeds, the exchange of seeds, the fact of uh, having some, uh, uh, some seeds keepers in, in many communities is also a very important point in that dispute. From a more um, political uh, um, theory, we can see that that kind of uh, educational spaces are at the same time some kind of very, very local public spaces where private issues are being publicized and are being built up as being political from the grassroots. And they are also in the in theory of Nancy Fraser, that kind of subaltern counter, counter public. So the kind of spaces 
which are um, building some kind of um, counter-hegemonic discourse, I don't know if it's clear in English, where um, people are building another view um, on the economy, on the environment, on gender, on indigenity, on, on, on many, many dimensions, um, um, starting from a subaltern position. Um, and of course, uh, these groups are, uh, ha are working also because they have political allies, uh, like NGOs, uh, like the feminist movement, and uh, like some research projects that maybe we are part of. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's the one dimension. Another important dimension is uh, the kind of political solidi solidarity-based economy uh, that is able to give some value uh, to the kind of projects that the women are producing. On the first picture left, uh, the woman here, she's called Donalia, she is uh, showing with pro uh, um, a booklet which is called Caderneta Agroecologica, an agroecological notebook, and this has been a quite important project in Brazil. And this is uh, a, a book um, for each month. Uh, she will um, she will uh, write up what she has been producing uh, in 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 her plot in her property, which has been consumed by the family. So kind of non-monetary production, which is normally totally invisible. And then what she has been giving to some neighbors, relatives, parents, etc. Um, what she has been bartering with others, which are normally the same people, relative neighbors, and so on. And finally, what has been sold. And this um, project has been uh, made with 2,000 women, 2,000 women farmers, which is a huge work because every everyone needs to be accompanied. And what came up is that actually, when you sum up all <laughs> of this value, you have in many, many cases, a value which is higher than the, uh, the net revenue of the husband or another man of the family. And it was um, a huge um, result. Not to, uh, not to invisibilize, not to, how should I say, the point is not to, to minimize what the men are bringing, but to value what the women are, are bringing. So that's very important. Uh, so non-monetary uh, economy. Um, and then um, the kind of um, consumers groups were also involved. Man, uh, I was taking, I was talking about just uh, a minute ago. Uh, here, for example, the kind of uh, so-called solidarity basket was a, a composition of different projects that we know also from Europe. And uh, here also a very uh, classical uh, kind of solidarity economy marketplace in that kind of feminist one, uh, which is more or less a realization of the, the, the small model we have just seen. So from a, a more theoretical point of view, what we have here is a kind of substantive view on the economy. No? Economy as being uh, the kind of process which is mobilizing, mobilizing material resources to meet up with needs and not the formal approach to economy which uh, only uh, visualize the dimension of the relation between demand and offer. Uh, I'm referring to the, the approach of Karl Polanyi in particular, uh, with his, the substantive approach to the economy, which is also a recognition of the plurality of the economy, which is not just market economy, uh, but which rely on different principles like reciprocity, redistribution, and householding. And market economy is just one principle among others. Um, and yes, as you can, <laughs> you can guess, as you surely have already understood, this is a very collective and political uh, construction. Um, so, what I, I want to 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 to, to see to, to yes to <laughs> to tell you is that um, the way that commitment occurs is a very multi-dimension, multi-dimensional, and multi-level process, which involves education as politicization with the resignification of reproductive work, um, with um, some. Um, spaces, some processes, some methodology for exchange knowledge and strengthening practice 
and building that kind of solidarity economy, which is not only a monetary but also a social uh, value or valuation <laughs> of work and um, which is absolutely key for uh, getting uh, uh, economic sustainability and legitimacy to that process. Is agroecology will not work if it's not uh, economically viable, of course, so it's very important. Um, on uh, the agroecological dimension, um, I think it might be clear now why it's not, it's at the same time an ecological basis, practice and technique, but it's also very strongly a social movement and political economy and this is multi-level and it's important to say that we are constantly um, seeing some interaction between the levels. It's not only the bottom up but also because there is an organization at a broader level more people will be able to get into the the, <laughs> the train to, to get into the agroecological transition because there are some existing processes. Okay, so it's a kind of dialectical process across the scales. And of course, there are some territory uh, where this kind of construction is very present, uh, very strong, and there are territories where it is not absent. So we have very contrasting situation across the territories. Um, and here's the, the yes, the kind of uh, another another counter uh, cartography that we we made in another um, in another municipality, uh, which precisely um, uh, highlights a different dimension which are involved in the local resistances, which involve identities, which involve techniques and practices in agroecology and some kind of care relation and political uh, commitment, socio-economic organization and uh, some kind of uh, negotiation of the sexual division of labor. So we were able in the research to, to concretely show the ways that di this different dimension uh, of the processes of committing to agroecology uh, are being constructed. And to finish with, um, uh, committed against what? Sorry, we we'll take a seat <laughs> um, because it's heavy now. Because <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> committed against what? Um, some kind of very list project from the territory to the bedroom, just to <laughs> make a provocation to get you awake, uh, to keep you awake at that uh, hour of Friday evening. <laughs> So, uh, coming back to the coffee monoculture that we, we first um, saw in the introduction, here we have a coffee landscape, not just one husband's um, coffee uh, plot, but uh, a small look at the dimension uh, of coffee monoculture in uh, Minas Gerais. I don't know if you know that coffee is uh, the second uh, raw material in terms of global exchange. And Brazil is the first export country in the world, and Minas Gerais is the first uh, state to export coffee in Brazil, and Zona da Mata is the first <laughs> region in Minas Gerais to export coffee. So it's you come there and you just see coffee, 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 coffee everywhere. So that's the dimension. And why does why does uh, the, the global market of coffee produce a coffee landscape? Uh, why do we have a landscape of coffee? Uh, because um, it comes to be the kind of valuable project, as a kind of commodity which is being valued and um, which is um, sustained uh, by a range of local institutions from the local market to the banks and financial intermediaries to technical assistance to every local institution in the territory is um, orienting and actually forcing, obligating, almost obligating every farmer to, to make some coffee. It's very, very difficult in that kind of regions, for example, to get uh, a credit, a rural credit. It, even from the public policy, you don't get a public credit to 
uh, to make something else. For example, if you want to make some agroforestry in in Minas Gerais in, in Zona da Mata, you you won't get any money from in, from anybody. So it's very very heavy. It's um, pushing to uh, uh, um, an extreme uh, productive specialization with the use of chemical fertilizers, transgenic seeds and agrotoxins uh, that we were speaking about at the beginning. Of course, coffee is one example. In other regions, we have tomatoes, banana, soya, sugar, etc. Uh, and breeding also. So it's, uh, coffee is just one case, of course. Um, and it's really defining land use and land division until the most familiar family level. And it's producing conflicts and the kind of resistance that we have seen. So now um, we are getting back to that woman who had uh, her, her, her vegetable garden 20 centimeters from her man, uh, coffee monoculture, and what you are seeing here is a kind of feminist ethnomapping that we are producing in the project. Um, I will briefly explain. So after um, two or three days or, or being there, of visiting, of talking with the woman, um, we make a proposal to her, which is to take some time, several hours, to make a picture from her point of view, uh, which is not necessarily uh, objective. Uh, the scale is never very precise. Here it's almost precise, but in many cases it's actually a, um, uh, an, an ethno perception and not an objective map, obviously. And um, to put on the um, on the picture information about what is being grown and by whom and what is important to her. So I won't go in in any in all details, of course. But here, that's very small plot here, with many many uh, um, uh, things on it. That's the house, of course. <laughs> Uh, the house is here, that's uh, the blue, the small blue square. Uh, the vegetable garden is here. And um, all around the house, uh, you have a very, very rich biodiversity, which are all the, the small thing written. And you have a lot of flows. Uh, the, the yellow um, arrows are showing some ecological flows inside the property. So you just can notice also at a broad level that there are many, many, many flows coming and getting from the kitchen, from the house, into the other subsystem of the, of the agroecosystems. And then uh, a more, um, um, maybe 8% <laughs> of the property is dedicated to coffee. So that is the kind of small trees you can see everywhere. Um, and um, here, for example, the picture that you, you showed, you, you, we were, um, the picture was taken here, exactly at that, at that border between the garden and the coffee. Um, and here at the, um, in the bottom, you have the kind of wet, um, wet area, which is called Brejo uh, in Brazil, where you cannot have some coffee, otherwise there would be some coffee. But in that case, that's impossible. Um, and which is important too. Um, here we have some some cl some some little pictures. Um, the um, the pink one uh, they are they, they they represent some some female work, and the grey one some male work. So you can see that around the house um, you have some female work, and on the coffee. Uh, you have some male work, and here it's uh, near the house. It's because uh, when coffee is being collected, you have to um, um, uh, to dry the coffee. And here the, the man will participate, and at some point, the woman will also participate to to make the collect of coffee of coffee, which is very very work intensive. But basically, you have a very typical sexual division of labor here and um, uh, sexual division of space, not only of labor. And uh, the fact that the area around, around the house is very, very small uh, is, uh, uh, well, the first level of expression of a power relation. He decides on, on what is going to be grown and because uh, global markets value coffee, coffee is being grown with uh, agrotoxins. and. Uh, the other kind of chemical fertilizer. So understand, yes, you understand, I hope, why we have women in that position and why this is a social relations of power, which come from different level. Uh, it's not because 
so her husband is a bad guy and she is a nice girl, but it's because everyone is being stuck into uh, gender relations and, and market relations in, in the case of the man. Um, here we have another uh, product of our research, which has been made with one of the, the group um, of in one of the unions in a, a, a city called Simonesia, a city which is actually a very rural area. And um, this is um, part of the, the histories uh, as perceived by the women for a very important period, which is uh, between 1970 and uh, 2000s, when the coffee wa was introduced into the region. And so, well, the history is, is represented as a river, and uh, we, we call it a river of life, which is a more organic way to think of time and not just a line, but that's not exactly my part now. I just want to show you a little bit of the contents. So here, IBC uh, is the uh, institute, uh, um, uh, the Brazilian Institute of Coffee, which first introduced the coffee in the region. Um, and this, uh, on one side, had some positive impact that brought money. Uh, people were able to get some energy in 1985. The, uh, the electricity arrived into the. the uh, the, the, the town and people would get some television and that was nice, of course. <laughs> um, but at the same time, um, the uh, kind of technical assistance which was made um, was for the women a project of death and, and that brought transgenic seeds, in that case that's mice. And also uh, that would mean that men's um, um, income would rise and women income will diminue because of that kind of unequal division of land inside the family. Um, and then, they, well, they affirm that uh, oppression is constant, but uh, fighting or mobilization are also constant, so they are always organizing. And here you can see some different, um, some different uh, dimension of the way they organize into a women commission, into the union, they organize into the church, which is also the kind of uh, of, uh, of female of women uh, uh, space. And here you have also the dimension of mining, which came to their community and until today uh, were not able to to begin activities because of their mobilization. So they have been resisting for 33 years. Um, so um, the second point to, to which I want to come back to explain against what they are mobilizing is exactly mining. We have shown and different points that mining was very present. And um, here uh, we are speaking about a dispute about the subsoil, actually a, a dispute about the relation between the subsoil and the, <laughs> the soil itself and on the fact that it would be possible or not to uh, make uh, coexist uh, exploitation of minerals with some kind of organic production like agroecology. Um, here, for example, in, in, the zona, in the Zona de Mata, we have the exploitation of bauxite, uh, which is used from making aluminum. And uh, it's a, a kind of superficial uh, mineral, which is found like three meters underneath uh, the soil only. And that means that um, for the mining companies, the model is to make some excavations directly into the family farming land, not to build, not to buy like a, a very big plot of land and to uh, to 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 make some large scale exploitation, but some very very small scale exploitation in the land of the family. And that's very important for gender relations because that means that the company will deal with directly with the family, which is of course an extremely unequal relations. And in that uh, in that kind of relation, that's always a man who is called to deal with the, um, with the mining company. Um, here I have some very s short citation uh, citation of one of the man farmer speaking of his neighbor. My neighbor received an offer from the mining company at one dollar per ton of clay. He turned it down because he thought it wasn't much. He could have become rich. In his place, I would have accepted. 
and this is a kind of dilemma. Um, uh, the different opinion of, of the man and his neighbor is a kind of dilemma the, uh, the main farmers are exposed to, because on one hand, it's of course a very, very small dividend of the wall mining uh, business, and the neighbor was aware of it, and it turned the offer off. But on the other side, this other man thinks, well, in comparison to what I have, that's actually better. So that's a kind of uh, evidence of the very ambi ambivalent position that these men are occupying. They are at the same time in a position of relative domination to the women of their families, but at the same time at the very bottom of the value chain of mining and also of coffee, for example. So they are exactly at the interface between the two relations, the class relation, which is also racial and ethnic relation to the other men, and then the gender relation to the women and their families. Um, yes, so from, from a more um, theoretical point of view, um, both the mining and uh, the agro the kind of uh, monoculture and uh, productive specialization we have just picked of, sp uh, spoken of in relation to coffee has been uh, uh, terrorized in Latin America as being a new moment of extractivism in the sense of extracting value from one territory, not in benefit to that territory, but to some other, uh, well, first to the, to the companies and then to some other uh, stakeholder which are outside the territory. So you are extracting value from one territory and kind of uh, unequal relations. In that model of extractivism that we find both in mining and in intensive agriculture, uh, you have what uh, gender theory have called industrial breadwinner masculinity. That means that masculinity is being constructed around uh, the idea that to be a real man, to be recognized as a man, you have to, you have to um, uh, accept. You have to, to um, um, how do you call that in English? You have to, um, yes, to, um, yes, you have to accept. You have to, to, <laughs> to be. Um, um, I don't find my word. Adhérer en français. Adhérer. Yes. Well, you have to complain to the kind of industrial par paradigm, which is the dominant paradigm. And in doing so, you're going to be able to earn some money and to com to to comply your responsibility as a breadwinner. So when the the, the companies, the technical assistants, the banks, the uh, local uh, intermediary of coffee, for instance, come and speak to the men uh, uh, farmers. They are playing with that. They are playing with the representation and the social obligation for this man to be breadwinners and to get some income in some situation which are sometimes very, very difficult to them. So they are uh, using the male social group uh, to 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 make their projects uh, being done. I'm not saying exactly that they are instrumentalizing that relation, which would induce that they are aware of it and want to make it. But in in practice, they are using the male group, the male social group. And this, in turn, um, as, as a result, makes a men's income increase and the women's work being devaluated, and that increases the relation of power between men and women. And for doing so, um, and here I'm, I'm based on, on um, against on the work of Martin Holtmann and Paul Poulet, the men are taught to put the kind of um, environmental contamination, destruction, ecological issue on the second, on the background. They are talked even emotionally to just ignore that you have to concentrate on generating an income, you have to be a real man and okay, we know there are some issues, but well, we'll see later. Um, Hartmann and Poulet and the literature on ecological masculinity show very well how all this happened from a very personal to a more collective and societal level. That's very, very um, impressive work. 
Um, at the same time, of course, um, the, the farmers, the men farmers and also the women farmers, actually the whole family is exposed in their own bodies. They are the one uh, suffering with intoxication, with cancers, with deaths, with children being uh, exposed to that kind of agrotoxin. So they are, of course, in a very unequal uh, relation. But the women are those who are mobilizing because they are absolutely exposed and excluded from the benefit of that model in all dimension. In class, ethnical, racial and gender dimensions, they are the ones who are suffering the consequences and that's why they are committing. It's not because they are nice, it's because they are in that social position. So to conclude, um, sorry I've been a little bit long but now I'm really finishing. Uh, tentative overview, um, why are um, women farmer committed to agroecology? What does that mean to our debate on ecological engagement to have that kind of subject, uh, of political subjects committed to uh, agroecology as a common cause? Uh, there is an ecological dimension. These women are trying to reproduce not life in general, but lives, lives in plural which match to them. They want first justice for their environment, for their territory, and every scale is politically constructed. They are not given, they depend on the kind of network, the kind of articulation, connection we have been talking of. Uh, economic organization is essential. Uh, there won't be agroecology if there's no uh, kind of alternative value uh, being created. Solidarity-based political economy, um, um, broadly speaking, is a condition for commitment. It brings monetary and social value, for example, the Caderneta, this agroecological booklet, and it's a plural economy where not only market, but a different kind of relation based, for example, on reciprocity, where distribution and so on are being constructed and embedded into social political uh, relations. Um, there is, uh, there are <laughs> different uh, political dimension in it. Uh, caring as a social position, position is being reclaimed, resignified, uh, gain a different and positive mi meaning. And this happened from the kind of local public spaces and subaltern kind of publics that we have uh, sp uh, been speaking of that are um, almost always also some kind of educational spaces. A challenge, of course, is getting upscale, not being only at that kind of very local spaces, but having some allies, getting into contact also with public policies, with uh, the institutional spaces where uh, the agriculture model is being decided and uh, to, to get some influence in that spaces. And that occur in a context in Brazil, but which is not limited to Brazil, of historical inequality and structural violence, which make it difficult at each step to, uh, to be heard and to get some kind of justice. It's a fight. Um, and to really, really finish with um, a more reflexive view of the kind of research we are we are trying to do in the Changible projects, it's interdisciplinary, of course, uh, between social and and uh, environmental sciences. In that case, agroecology. Although I am very well aware that I'm not able to bring interdisciplinary alone, I, I would need to to bring a colleague from Brazil <laughs> to speak with me. But um, uh, yes, that's a collective work. But also to reflect on the fact that um, I'm always speaking from the local scale. I'm speaking from very particular realities. Uh, because we are working with a kind of standpoint uh, feminist it's epistemology which assumes that there is no kind of global objectivity, that we try to objectivate facts that we observe always from very local level to recognize that we are not seeing Brazil in each age, uh, in each detail, but we are seeing from uh, a detailed view in searching uh, property, which is actually not bad, <laughs> and from six collective, which are also situated, and yes, we are producing situated knowledge and trying to gain generality from a very deep understanding and a kind of 
um, comparison or dialogue between the context. I think that di dialogue is more appropriate because we are not comparing one variable to one other, but we are trying to um, to to um, test the, the the category we are constructing by putting them to the uh, in comparison to the to the different contexts that we are looking at. Thank you very much for your patience on Friday evening. <laughs> and yes, sorry for being a little bit long. We have almost 40 minutes. Hi, I'm Isabella from Brazil. Yes. Uh, so I have some questions. Uh, first, I would like to know how like things were summed in the Caderneta Agroecológica, because like if it's a non-monetary quantification, like how do you add kilos of man mandioca with coffee? Like, how was this done? Also, uh, like a bit reversing the question that was done to us in the evaluation of this subject, is that like, do you think that this is more appropriate uh, for specific scales, like small projects, or if this is reproducible at a larger scale. Also, I would like to know, uh, like all of this engagement of agroecology, um, yeah. And uh, what do you think, like enabled women that are already overworked to engage politically in the education project? Uh, do you see something in common among the different uh, municipalities or places that you uh, analyze? Like if there was mm, something that like sparked this uh, like urgency to to organize like the educational project, as you said, or yeah. And thank you for the presentation. Usually we collect questions, oui, but uh, I don't know. Okay, so. Hi, I'm Domitilla from Italy. Uh, thank you for, for the presentation. It's always uh, inspiring hearing stories like that. And I was wondering uh, whether uh, such communities, let's say, uh, are uh, in a broader international network as well. And as Isabella asked whether um, this project can be more than applied in a larger scale, but sort of coordinated, applying and sharing different feminist practices all over the world, like in different contexts as well. Um, yep. Thank you. Okay, a third and then we I'm Kushi and I'm from India. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. So my question was related to when you talked about how does, let's say, the commitment occur. You talked about how there is education being used for politicization. So my question was that how do we get to praxis in the sense, um, in a cultural sense, we are, let's say, changing how knowledge is composed and we are giving different ways of like formulating knowledge. but um, how do we apply these counter hegemonic discourses, uh, especially when like they have limited power within the society? So, how exactly like we take it to the structural level as opposed to like just keeping it on the cultural level? Thank you. V very good questions. I will do my best. <laughs> Okay, well, I will start with um, the more factual one, the more uh, easy one about the Cadeneta, which I, um, I'm, I was not able to explain properly in my presentation. Of course, you are right, um, quantifying and um, and finding some, some monetary equivalent for the value is a very big issue um, in, in many uh, regions. Uh, um, you have um, some kind of regional measurements being used and uh, it's not patronized. So, 
there was a wall work of accompanying these women, uh, which was done by the activists from the agroecological movement. And in many cases also there was a kind of against educational processes, which um, in this case was involving daughters or sometimes some sons of the, of the women farmers, um, where uh, young people were a little some of them, not all of them, but some of them are, are more educated. And so um, this was made in dialogue. Uh, you also have, in, of course, in, in, in the, the basis of the 2,000 women who responded to the Cadaneta women who do not write and read, so somebody else in the family uh, would have to, to take notes. So that's a, a process with a lot of mediations with a lot of intermediate level to count to an aggregate results, and that's not the woman herself in the kitchen able to uh, to put all the equivalents. And um, there were some very political discussion too about the fact to, to giving some uh, monetary equivalent to all products, yeah, which is also a way to, to convey a, a monetary vision of everything, but it was well, a political decision to say, well, we have to m get visibility, that's a priority, so we'll, we'll do that. But I can remember, for example, of discussion with indigenous women who said, no, we, we, I won't put uh, the project of, how do you call it, la chasse? Um, of hunting, I won't put the products of hunting into the cadaneta because it's intrinsic value, no. I won't get some equivalent value for the, the animals I am hunting and the forest because they have even a spiritual value. So, that's, so there are limits very, very, very clearly. Um, <coughs> but the issue of scales, um, we are not working with good praxis and reproducibility, not, not, not. <laughs> we are working with politicization along activist networks along commitment engagement network which are cross scaling upscaling down scaling jumping producing that kind of sometimes sometimes fragmented um, political geography but very connected one um, with international levels yes um, for example, um, very clearly, the, the feminist uh, movement, uh, the, wor the, the world march of women uh, have played an important role. Um, the secretary of this movement, the international secretary, has been in Brazil for many years and uh, made the Brazilian very much connected to different uh, um, groups and activists in other countries of Latin America, of Africa, of Europe, as far as I know, Asia, I'm not sure, but yes, that kind of, of um, actually the, 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 the way scale is being constructed is absolutely interrelated with the networks of activism at different level uh, and with public policy too. Um, and yes, um, so I'm, I'm connecting with your, your, your question on the more structural impact. I, I, I have not spoken almost of pu public policies, but structural impact is, um, is achieved to getting upscale, but also getting into the state, of course, getting into the, <laughs> the levels of decision on the, the agricultural model and, um, and also on, on gender uh, uh, representation. To, to give you one example, um, the, the, so the, the, the way that um, women farmers uh, reconceptualize uh, their garden, which are called quintais in Brazil, um, valuing diversity, valuing uh, production for self-conception and non-monetary use, uh, valuing the invisible work of reproduction of life, has been have be, have fueled um, an agenda which has been called uh, quintais, um, from the very grassroots level to the Marcha das Margaridas, which is a mass mobilization. We we have seen a picture of just at the beginning. And that Marsha of Das Margaridas got 
a public policies, which was called quintais produtivos, productive quintais, productive gardens. And there, at the point where it became a public policy, it's um, <laughs> it lost uh, the emphasis, the highlight on being reproductive, and it was called productive at the just moment when it came into contact with the states. So it was in some way being uh, de-characterized. I know if you can say that in English. And then the political publicity is being executed, executed and it's being, um, uh, there are some NGOs uh, uh, being enabled to execute the policy in the territories. And some of the NGOs are the same one who had on the first moment had worked to, to get that agenda. And now they got the money and they got the public policy and they have to work again to make that political, that public policy for productive gardens being again a policy for the productive garden. So that's a kind of <laughs> getting impact, getting a structural change, but also being um, transformed uh, and, and exposed to the kind of dominant bias towards productivity, which always happen, I think, when you come in contact with the dominant uh, spaces. Okay, that's okay. I'm never sure whether my, my English is clear enough. Um, and yes, on educational processes, um, work overload, and what are we talking about uh, with that kind of educational processes? Um, I think it was not very clear and concrete, but um, uh, this, this woman, for example, they are not being hired to participate into an educational process. That's because that's just emerged, because um, that people meet, people make uh, uh, organize. Uh, they want, for example, uh, the production to be um, brought into Sao Paulo, which is 400 kilometers from there, and you need to pick up some some product there and here. So that's a very concrete issue at the beginning. And then you have some women who get it and think, well, it could work that way and that way and that way, and that means that and that. And they, they begin to make a kind of organic reflection. And then the, the, the meeting of the association will turn an educational process. Education arises from, con from, from very concrete issues and from the fact that you have uh, people there who are thinking and who are theorizing what they are doing. And, and women farmers, of course, have the capacity to, to educate one other. Now, there are also uh, enabling conditions who are brought by the NGOs and by, by us too as universities. Um, actually, uh, the way we executed our research, executed now, the way we, <laughs> we practice our research was always trying to, to make every meeting have some educational dimension, which was not we speaking and teaching to the people, but trying to make a kind of dialogue and collective reflection. So, yes, they are overlaid. Yes, sometimes they will not participate. Yes, they are exhausted, but um, it's not like an external educational project coming on the top of them. But yes, there is a work of a lot issue and an issue of negotiating the division, the, se the sexual division of labor. In educational meetings, we make some um, uh, uh, we, we make an activity with hours, uh, with the 24 hours of a day and trying to, to make a reflection on how time is being used and it's, it's uh, a strong methodology. Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. I thought it was very interesting, especially um, because we just had a presentation about critical minerals like lithium, cobalt, copper, aluminum. And it was a lot about the macroeconomic perspective, supply, demand, inflation. But I want to get your perspective on what this kind of mining, new kind of mining means for this woman uh, from their point of view, and if you have any example in Brazil. 
just a tiny other question. We had a, a class of solidarity economy this morning, and we had a speaker from Brazil that was talking about the national network of local currencies in Brazil, um, about social money and alternative currencies, and was organized by community banks. You mentioned it's hard to get a credit or a loan from banks for um, agroecology in Brazil. And I wanted to know if you were in contact with these networks of community banks and if they can, if they help the movement in any way. Um, hi, my question was also similar to what Kushi was asking about um, the popular education as politicization. Um, I was just thinking with this project, it is good how um, it's working on engaging women farmers and um, you talked about the line between engagement and essentialism. But I was wondering, because you also talked how a couple, uh, with the example of monoculture of coffee, how, how the husband farms and how the wife farms, um, the differences they had. So my thing was like, when you work with just women, does this give men farmers a buyout from caring about the environment like how um, how does that dynamic come into play especially because of the um, power dynamics between men and women in the in the community um, how because you're just working with the women farmers so how does it affect with the uh, power dynamics of men and women farmer and also if this enables men farmers to get a buyout from caring about environment because this specifically just works for women farmers. Hi, yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm Lucien uh, from France. This was Lou. From <laughs> France. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm Pratiba from Nepal. Um, uh, yeah, I had a question um, regarding the, the slide that you had about the feminist debate between engagement and essentialism and the the evidence that you showed about these women and what they thought about the, their or how they expressed their gendered identity um and you mentioned um in passing uh, spivak's concept of strategic essentialism etc um it made me think of uh, the anthropological literature on uh, plural identities especially plural gendered identities and um this idea of plurality really came through in your presentation and a uh, very local situated knowledge etc um but then it, in that slide about the the um, this tension between engagement and uh, essentialism i felt as though that was maybe perhaps missing so i wonder if you could expand a bit on um potentially there being incoherences and contradictions within these women's gendered identities and how that may be part and parcel actually of their engagement um I don't know if that was clear, but yeah. Uh, my question is very linked to uh, Jocelyn from Costa Rica. Uh, my question is very linked to what was uh, the question of Lou. It's like usually we have problems trying to uh, close women to access to finance because usually they don't have access to land so it's usually a common problem so maybe if you can because you you discuss that briefly but maybe you can have more inputs regarding uh, the access of these women to these finance instruments and if they have access to the specialized instruments uh, for women's needs in in the communities thank you Well, thank you very much. Um, very good questions again. Um, where should I begin? Um, well, on maybe the, the mining question. Who uh, Lou ask about mining question? Yes, we have mining here at a very micro experiential level, which is different from uh, the the kind of also very useful uh, macro view on on the mining um, uh, situation at the moment and the geopolitical um, situation. Zona da Mata is a region which has not been mined uh, until recently, 
uh, well, actually, you have a very uh, historical region at the at the western side on Mariana and Oro Preto, which has been uh, mined from colonial times. But here we are on the east side of Zona da Mata, and we are talking of bauxite. And um, this is very much linked to uh, the, the period fr starting from the years 2000, where the commodities prices began to rise. And this is linked to with uh, the more recent period uh, with the, 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 uh, the low transition, the low carbon uh, transition from the, the European Union, China, and the United States, uh, which need bauxite and not just lithium and uh, some other rare minerals, uh, bauxite and you call it um, le cuivre. Uh, copper, yes, are needed also for, for I, I, as far as I know, I don't want to, to say some mistake, but for infrastructure. And so for these women and men in the community, that means that uh, mining companies are being there f since two or three decades. Um, some, and that's, that's, I think the, 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 the earlier was a, at, at the beginning of the years 90. And for them, um, that means that um, agents from these companies are coming to their territories, are making s some offers of, uh, of um, uh, renting the land, of uh, hiring some always men, first always men for being uh, truck drivers for doing different kinds of low-paid jobs uh, on the mining spots, and it means a huge risk of loss of sovereignty and destruction of their, of their environments. Uh, it's surrounded by fear, by um, depressions, uh, by psychological troubles, by um, violence, um, environmental destructions. We have been uh, with a groups of women who wanted that. We have been visiting one of the region which is already uh, being mined um, by a national aluminium companies that I would not name, but <laughs> uh, in the region of uh, Zona da Mata in Mirai, not, not to name it. And they were crying. They were crying because um, everything was destructed. You had a truck passing every 20 seconds. You have no children on the communities, a uh, huge risk of sexual violence on women and girls. There was a huge, um, there were a lot of dust everywhere. Trees would not grow, and there were some plots who were supposedly being restored by the company, and there was nothing growing, obviously, because when you destroy the subsoil, uh, you don't have organic life um, after that. So that's a kind of local experience of how mining is, is coming, and agroecology is being built up as a political response to mining in the sense of an economic alternative of but also more deeply of a, a different view of fully fully different view on nature and van environment and absolutely discording from the dominant discourse on the sustainable production of minerals but now there are very strong debates uh, in the the social movements about okay well actually we, we need some minerals so um, is there a possibility to have a mining model with some sovereignty, uh, local sovereignty on it, which will be totally different from extractivism, or um, should we stop mining? What about recycling the minerals which have already been collected? And well, it's a complicated debate, but the, ki the kind of debates that are occurring at local levels. I don't know if I'm answering. Yes, okay. Um, on um, solidarity economy and finance and access to land and to credit. Um, and don't remember who asked. Uh, you, you asked, well, okay, uh, okay, both of you, yes. 
Um, so yes, in, I know of course uh, bancos comunitarios de desenvolvimento, finanças solidarias. There are no such banks in the territory we are working. I know them from other territories, and in some cases, yes, of course, uh, there are some links. Um, uh, bancos, uh, this kind of community development banks, can finance. Um, <coughs> Uh, and, and sometimes with local currencies, some agroecological um, experiences. I know some of them, not in our project, but for example in Bahia. Uh, but which, which is more present in our context are the kind of uh, saving and credit cooperatives, which are also part of, of uh, solidarity finance. But even even that kind of cooperatives will not necessarily finance uh, the more radical projects. Even um, as we had a long long talk with one a young couple uh, doing coffee in agroforestry. Agroforestry is growing your coffee in trees, um, and not as a kind of. Um, um, open up uh, sun uh, uh, monoculture, which is normally practiced. And that's a radical technical choice, and they were very, very, very well uh, formed to do that. They had everything, but they could not get a credit, for example, even from the saving and credit cooperative. So the, the institutional weight of the technical model and the vision of, of what would be development is extremely strong. I'm not saying that it does not exist, but I'm saying that it's not automatic. <laughs> um, and um, th there have been um, different policies of access of women to, to land titles and to rural credit in Brazil uh, from the 90s as a result of the first mobilization of women farmers. In our small sample, for example, we have about half of the women having some plot of land in their names. And most of them, not in only in their names, but in the names of them and of the husband, so the, the, both of them. And in most cases, this is because the land came from the family of the, of the woman. It is inherited land. Yet, um, this help, but is not guarantee access to credit, but they, there are some kind of uh, uh, rural credit policies uh, specifically for women. In the context of agroecology, I would not say that access to finance is the most pressing problem because um, th there, are, there are different reasons, but um, it's not a technological intensive technology. Uh, so th there's not there are not huge amounts of money involved, and also because it's a culture where people don't want debt. They they don't see credit; they see debt, and they, most of them don't want to go into debt. So they will they will make some different arrangements. But we we are, I, I'm not say it's not important, but I'm not I'm, I'm I think it's not the key issue for them. But land, land title and decision about our land is very important. <laughs> um, about essentialism and um, engagements. So what, what I wanted to say in about masculinities in, in plural. Um, what I wanted to say about uh, essentialism is that um, I'm not saying that it's a problem for the women themselves to, um, to engage from that social position of being a carer. I'm saying that for most people from outside, and particularly feminist intellectual from here, for Western <laughs> uh, feminist and critical theorist more broadly, that seems to be a problem. But for the people there, that's not because that's the only social position. So we have to take a different look at them and to recognize a power to power of action embedded in that social position and the power to redefine um, what that means and to get a different value, which also depends on the concrete uh, kind of economy and valuation that's, in, that's being constructed. And um, on, th on the point of view of men, yes, I, I reflected very little on, on it on my presentation, but um, yes, it was a, 
a limitation, uh, but yes, we very much spoke with men. Uh, it was extremely important to us to differentiate also between um, the different experiences um, of masculinities in plural that men are doing. And yes, we very much have, um, as part of the men, we have engaged in what we see as a kind of transition to ecological masculinity. That's a, the category that um, Martin Hultman and Paul Poulet are, are, are bringing. And this happened almost always um, with at least two important factors. First, one woman in the family, most uh, often the woman, the, the spouse, push them up. So that's almost the case. Uh, it began with a dispatch, it began with a conflict, it began with I won't work with you in the coffee, I won't have sex with you, I won't cook for you, I won't... So that's very, very intimate conflict. If you... Uh, we had one, one woman saying, I told to my husband, if you put glyphosate into the coffee, you're going to lose me two times. You're going to lose me. You're going to lose me two times. You're going to lose me as a worker, and you're going to lose me as a woman. She was like, work and sex strike. So it's speaking like that. But then uh, what makes men change also is the existence of uh, spaces of alternative socialization, spaces where they can build another sense of being a man without, without being called ma uh, mad. Um, we have very strong um, uh, testimonies of men. I can tell you of one in particular uh, who made agroforestry again. That's not the same one that I spoke about. Um, he's called Pedro and he said, um, for 30 years I have been called a mad. People said I was mad because I was planting trees when all men in our families were um, cutting trees to put some buffers in that case. And now um, I'm being recognized as, as being a pioneer and I'm receiving um, schools and people from outside, and, uh, for example from the US, saying that what I'm doing is absolutely uh, extraordinary, but for 30 years I've been called a madman. So that's a kind of dequalification of, of violence also, that the men who depart from the norm are being exposed. So men are able to change also when they are finding some spaces where other men are doing the same, where they can say, okay, we are not <coughs> mad, we are doing another things, and that's right. And okay, we can be recognized uh, as being normal guys doing what we do. So that's a kind of counter hegemonic socialization for men too. Okay. Yes, okay. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I'm Anna, I'm from Brazil. And um, I would like to ask about um, violence against women in this kind of context, because this is something that inter is interesting in our societies and also in Brazil. So, and specifically in the countryside, there is a lot of uh, violence against women and uh, how does it work in this context and in this community? Um, how, what kind of uh, network they have, in in other words, uh, I would like also to ask, like, who care about uh, who is caring? You know, um, I think this is also an um, important question to raise in this um, discussion. Thank you. Hi, I'm Felicia from Brazil too. Thank you. <laughs> this was amazing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I have two questions. One is regarding the beginning of the Gengibre project. I would like to understand a little bit more about this dialogue between academia and the community, like the women's, how they, how you build like this network and how you can make like methods to make it stronger and and the empower the, the, the women there. And another question is regarding the mining. 
So I would like to understand, you talked a little bit about public policies. Uh, I would like to understand if the government uh, in some kind of ways in the, in the, is in between the, the women and, and the enterprise, the mining uh, companies. So I would like to listen a little bit more about that. Thank you. So another question from Brazil there. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. It was amazing. Um, I felt a bit, a bit homesick, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I am. I am Enzo from Brazil. <laughs> yes. Um, so you, you, you said that uh, it's fundamental that the government uh, takes a, a role into increasing the scale of these projects, but at the same time, um, it's a bit dangerous because it can lose the essence of the project and something that could be ecofeminist can turn into a productive or like falling to the logics of capitalism. So my question is, um, building on what Felicia said, uh, it, what, what, what were the fundamental differences when it comes to the mandates? For instance, the transition from Bolsonaro's government to Lula's government. If there are fundamental differences and how did they impact in the, in the um, mobilization? Okay. You can stop here. You have five minutes for, the, for all the answers. Está bem, então vou seguir em português que vai ser mais fácil para mim. No, um, well, um, beginning maybe with the last question. Yes, we, um, we, you had. Uh, um, speaking as I said, I was Brazilian, but <laughs> there has been a, a very, very. Uh, environmental destructive government with Jair Bolsonaro from 2019 to 2022 and now we have uh, different governments with Lula as a president with but with a very very complicated and uh, oppositional um, national assembly in Brasilia since 2023 during uh, and also before that um, uh, from 2016, uh, uh, with the government of Michel Temer, there was also uh, a very strong environmental pressure. And I would say that even during the Workers' Labour Party, um, as well, the, the, the first governments in Lula uh, in the 2000s and of Dilma Rousseff at the beginning of the years 2010, environment was never an easy issue in Brazil. So should not imagine that uh, the most socially progressive governments uh, would have protects the environment. That's not true. But we came to a stage which was uh, extreme during the Bolsonaro government. And that began with a flexibilization of licensing uh, which make it much, much easier for the mining companies to get a kind of uh, licenses of authorization that they need to, uh, to act. And there is also an interplay with the level of states because there are some competencies, which many competencies are actually from the state government, not from the federal state, but for example, for the state of Minas Gerais. And in that special case with Romero Zema, um, we had also uh, <laughs> the kind of complementary action to distract environment. So uh, in no way the government would help uh, local communities and women in particular to regulate the action of mining companies. I think we can, we can, um, I'm being registered here. <laughs> but yes, we have many, many data uh, which proves that um, there are cases of collusion of interest and of uh, the government's, I'm being registered. <laughs> well, oh, it's, um, um, you, you, Yes, yes, yes. There are many cases where it's clearly um, it's clear that the government is on the side of the mining companies. To to say it very often. Um, so, at the municipal levels, um, battles are being fought to get the kind of very local regulations to avoid 
um, the most pervasive projects. Uh, for example, uh, laws on uh, waters, which is a kind of, um, how can I call it, um, by, by legislifying on water, by putting some, some laws on waters, you are able to protect the territories against, against the most uh, destructive uh, uh, aspects of mining. Um, and also there is a, a document which is called Carta de Anuancia, uh, I don't know how you call it in English, but it's like a, a local uh, document from the municipality to, to authorize uh, the, the mining company in, in the last uh, instance, and that might not be delivered in some cases. So you have an interplay between the three levels of government. Um, so yes, there are many, many. Uh, I, I really, I, I made my presentation from the local levels, but you have a very huge complexity of the action of states, of the states in in the different levels and in different dimension. Um, some political, some public policies are being indispensable for that that kind of project to exist. I think also of the kind of um, uh, public. Um, policy to buy the product of the family agriculture to uh, to for food in schools uh, penai pr uh, maybe i can talk with a brazilian one much much more interested in the local context uh, you have some social protection pro uh, programs for recognizing women as farmers with social rights which are also very very important but then you have all that other effects from that kind of uh, of deregulation of of the environment and with lula i think uh, well it's early to to make some some analysis but we have obviously a focalization of the amazonas on deforestation which is the most visible part of the environmental issue which is part of a kind of climate diplomacy i would say of brazil and then the other biomes are being, uh, I don't know if to say neglected, but much less visible and politicized. And the issue of agrotoxins, for example, which is invisible for long term, is totally ignored. Uh, Lula passed uh, the, the project lay, uh, uh, deregulating agrotoxin almost one year ago. So we have a lot of issue with actual government too. Um, on violence, um, you asked? No, you asked, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting tired, I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, yes, violence against women, it takes many forms. It takes many forms from the most uh, extreme one, like um, uh, sexual violences against women and girls to the most, um, 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 how you call it, banal, or the most, uh, in, uh, sim simple or apparently insignific insignificant ones like, like um, disqualifying your work, like being injured, like being called someone who don't know anything, which is the way that many husbands speak of the woman. You don't know anything, let me decide you stay at home and they are and that has been theorized by uh, uh, Liz Kelly in, in particular as being a continuum of violence to, to have a broad view at violence and not only uh, the most visible forms but to understand that violence is structural to maintain the kind of gender inequalities that exist and that you have to, 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 to see the link between the different forms of violence. That from a theoretical point of view. Then from a more practical point of view, there are delegacies, there are um, some institutions, but they are um, weakly efficient, I would say. Uh, and like in all contexts, that's not specific to Brazil, there are very, very few notifications. Uh, people, women, don't go uh, easily to that kind of places. And I think it's well known because they are not taken seriously, because they might be exposed to shame, etc., etc. So in the in the groups that we are working with, uh, the groups themselves act as a first defense against violence. And women take, of it, take care of each other. They are the first caring instance. For example, women would 
be will be very very careful if someone is missing. Why is she not here? What has happened? Uh, her husband didn't let her come, or why? Or she's sick, or she has been bitten. Let's have a look. So that's, a, that's the first level. And then in the kind of more politicized uh, groups where we have, when it comes to to uh, to cases of violence. Um, we can get some access to some lawyers and some kind of psychological help, etc. But that's not necessarily the, the the most common case. So it depends. But um, yes. <laughs> and about the, the projects, um, that was your question. Yes. Um, yes, I think time is the first ingredient. Um, actually, mm, my colleagues uh, have been working with uh, some of the groups for 20 years. Uh, myself, I have been working with that colleagues and with some of the groups for 12 or 11 years. So it takes a lot of time. Um, here we have a project funded by the INR, but actually the genesis of the project was former projects where <laughs> the question arise. And then me as an academic, I, I wrote the project in France because it was 2019 and it was impossible to get funding in Brazil under Bolsonaro for gender and agroecology, but otherwise we write project together. And anyway, at the time when we got the project and it was COVID-19, <laughs> we had to make a lot of uh, online meetings uh, in difficult conditions or to call with phone the persons to, to 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 make the fine tuning on the projects and it took months and then 2021 we were able to go back to the communities in a very very complex uh, context post pandemic and a lot of the networks being um, destructurated I'm, I'm telling that to, to say that we had to adapt to a context and that's normal in any uh, kind of project on the long term something happened and then you have to adapt to reformulate and that's a process so all the time we have been trying to co-construct maybe that's a, the, the, the most fundamental methodological uh, position to try to be open all the time to to understand what makes sense in that moment and to try to to um, build that kind of knowledge which will be useful for the people because they are with us, they are spending time with us in the context where they are actually overloaded in so far as it responds to some kind of priority to them. So that's the way we try to, to do it with limitation, obviously. <laughs>